Unleaded fuels and piston engines. Just how does that thing, how does that work anyway? Well, it's all about detonation and that's what we're gonna talk about today on Flywire, so stick with me. Hi, I'm Scott Perdue and today on Flywire, I wanna talk about unleaded fuel and general aviation. Kind of an important topic right now. Virtually all of commercial airline charter airplanes <laughs> the uh, military, all that stuff are turbine powered, and don't use gasoline anymore. So they don't count in this discussion. I must admit to you before I start though, that uh, I do love the smell of JP4. It there's, doesn't happen anymore, but to me it smells like, well, you know, adventure. It just reminds me of walking out to the flight line to strap on a jet so I can go fast and pull G's. Dang it, it just doesn't get better than that. But that was then, this is now. So here, oh, by the way, here's a bit of trivia for you. Uh, JP4 is what the Air Force burned when I was growing up, and it was a blend of 50% kerosene and 50% avgas. JP4 then had a relatively low flash point and was the root of a lot of accidents. For one thing, it had a tendency to build up a static charge following when, when it was flowing through pipes, and electrical grounding was hyper important. And sometimes, you know, it, it caused accidents, it caused fires. And sometime in the 80s, an entire KC-135 burned to the ground with a bunch of JP-4 in it, all from a simple little accident. So the USAF uh, switched to JP-8, and I think the Navy had already been using it uh, because they're on, on board ship. And it has advantages of its own, but it does not have any avgas. So <clears throat> when you're talking about detonation, blending, by the way, is what it's all about. What chemical cocktail do you mix into the gasoline-based stock to make, the, and it makes all the difference. Whatever it is you use, it makes all the difference. High horsepower piston engines require higher compression ratios, and with that, you flirt with detonation. And I think I'm safe in saying that virtually any engine over 180 horsepower uh, has a detonation issue to some degree. My Continental R670 seven-cylinder uh, radial in the steering has a 5.4 to 1 compression ratio. It does produce 225 horsepower, 220 horsepower, sorry. But it was designed when 65 octane, octane was the thing. And that was all that was available. And back then you got power with longer strokes and larger displacement. But you could not rev it very high, very slow. 2050 RPM is the limit, just over 2000 RPM but you can run it on shitty gas, so that's a good thing. Uh, a more modern design, like the Lycoming 0360 in this Husky at 180 horsepower and the IO 550B in the Bonanza with a nominal 300 horsepower have compression ratios of eight and a half to one. You can say that the vast majority of GA piston engines, uh, piston engine airplanes have a detonation issue. The lower powered ones don't really, but uh, it is an issue that affects us all. That's why we have 100 low lead. I'm sure you're asking yourself right now, what is detonation and why is it bad for my engine? Well, back when I was in college, I had to do a lab where I had to experiment with an engine. Okay, here's an engine, what do you wanna do with it? I chose to play with the effect of octane on the flame front propagation, detonation. Video cameras were non-existent, uh, film cameras were bulky, GoPro wasn't even a glint in somebody's eye, so no video or even pictures, but I swear it really happened. Uh, what I remember was the incredible variation between the time it took for the flame front to propagate across the cylinder, depending on the octane level of the fuel. It was very impressive. It was one of the labs I really enjoyed doing. Uh, first, let me say that in, in uh, simple terms, okay, let's talk about how ignition happens. A diesel engine has no spark plugs or a distributor to time the spark sent to the plug. A diesel, diesel, that diesel cycle ignites because of compression. Typical diesel, diesels operate at 12 to 20 to one compression. At some point, the heat of the compression stroke will trigger a flame. You get your flame front. Diesels use, most diesels use a glow plug, which is basically a protrusion into the combustion chamber that keeps hot via electrical resistance. It's always hot, and at a known temperature, and uh, the the way and at a known temperature, the way physics works is is that that glow plug will be the source of the fire, 
of the flame at the specific point in this compression cycle. Okay, we know how much we compress it, how much the heat compression is, and that temperature there will spark a flame. Off you go. That way you can control the flame front propagation and put the maximum power out uh, from the engine without destroying the pistons and the cylinders. For you diesel drivers uh, with acceleration at low speeds and low RPMs, sometimes you, you might have heard a rattling sound. For that matter, older drivers among us, you know, I guess my, that's me too, would uh, have experienced the same thing, same kind of rattling sound with cars before the advent of unleaded gas and knock sensors and all that stuff. And that, my friends, is detonation. Detonation in simple terms is an uncontrolled propagation of the flame front. It could be set off from a number of things. One of those things is the lead salts, the deposits and other, by, of, and other byproducts that are deposited on top of the piston or on top of the cylinder, uh, the cylinder head. So all that crap inside the cylinder, some of that crap gets hot and now you have pre-ignition, which could lead to detonation. Meaning the glow, the glow plug or spark plug firing did not initiate the flame front. It was off on some other reason, okay? And uh, detonation is an explosion. By definition, it is an explosion. And explosions are, on the good-bad scale, are bad. Eventually, it's gonna tear apart your engine. A controlled burn in a normal firing event gets hot for sure, but nothing like an uncontrolled burn. <clears throat> all those pressures. So just when all the fuel and air is burned up, the piston, this is the way it's designed, is gonna be over center and the higher pressure inside the cylinder pushes the piston down at just the right time to create a push on the crankshaft. That push translates to work, which makes the wheels on the bus go round and round, or in our case, the prop to spin. So that's how we translate that burn into work to help us fly or drive or whatever. So detonation eats your engine a little bit at a time. So how do you prevent it? How do you control the flame front? I know this is a lot of talking about unleaded fuel, but we got to talk about it because this is, this is bottom line here. So let's go back to the 1930s. Jimmy Doodle, that's who we're going to talk about, is instrumental in this story. He became a pilot in World War I, but did not see combat, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, because in the 20s he became a test pilot. And then he earned a PhD from MIT. He led the group with uh, working with Sperry to figure out how to do blind flying. Jimmy Doodle is responsible for instrument flying. In the 1930s, he took a leave of absence from the Army and eventually went into the reserves when he got a job with Shell Oil. He did a lot of testing, a lot of flying, and then he started working for Shell Oil. At Shell Oil, he realized the limitation on engine power and design was detonation. He lobbied Congress and the Army to use 100 octane fuel as a standard he developed that. He's the guy who developed 100 octane fuel and developed it for mass production. Jimmy Doolittle, what a guy, no kidding. The British RAF uh, were the first to use 100 octane fuel in combat during the Battle of Britain uh, in their Spitfires and their Hurricanes. High octane fuel was one of, those, one of the few big things that helped the Allies win the, win the war. And Jimmy Doolittle did that, no kidding. He was, he was huge. So how did he do it? Well, let me ask you first to think about what high octane fuel is. Is it some sort of chemical package that uh, when added to gasoline gives the fuel some extra punch of power? Or is it a chemical package that inhibits the burn time kind of like dumbing down the fuel so it doesn't have as much punch? What do you think? Well, Jimmy Doolittle and the engineers at Shell did a lot of experimentation and settled on a package that included lead compounds. That's where lead came from. For simplicity's sake, those compounds add complexity to the fuel chemistry, and burning it takes more time to consume a given volume of fuel and air. It slows the flame front down. I hate to burst your bubble, but high octane is a dumbed down fuel. In short, high octane means a less volatile fuel, and it burns at a slower rate, a known rate with the chemical package in, uh, in, mixed in. And because of that, they can control the flame front and we can get power out of the engine. We can go to very high uh, compressions and pull a lot of power out of engines. Okay, so when we do that, when we use higher compression ratios, then with octane, higher octane, the fuel is, we know how fast it's gonna burn. It's not gonna run away and detonate. 
typically really high horsepower engines are turbocharged or supercharged. Uh, the Merlin uh, that I mentioned uh, previously that the RAF used later in the war used a still higher octane uh, fuel, I think it was 115, 145, and had six to one compression ratio with a two-stage, two-speed supercharger. And that could boost the pressure uh, another 7.4 PSI or so, 7.4 uh, to one. Uh, and that engine in low blower could produce 1,490 horsepower at 61 inches of mercury at 13,000 feet. That's a lot of power. The P-51 also sang using this engine and won the air superiority battle over Europe in World War II, frankly. So, all due to high octane fuel from Jimmy Doolittle. Well then, lead is a good thing, right? We can run our engines harder and we get more power from them before they blow up. Great, well, not so fast. You can't uh, just put in the old PB atom by itself. You have to have it in a, a long chain molecule with other elements. And I'm not gonna go into all the byproducts of piston engine con combustion right now. Suffice it to say, there's some bad stuff left over that goes into the atmosphere uh, at various amounts. NOx, carbon monoxide, other stuff. And lead is a big player in the production of NOx, which is in turn a big player in smog and getting the lead out of automotive fuel cleaned up our air considerably. No kidding, absolutely. Made a huge difference. It also made the engine run cleaner by a huge margin. Nobody thought about that, but it did. Back in the old days, if you got a 60 to 80,000 miles out of a car, oh my gosh, you're doing great, unheard of. 100,000 miles on a car was extraordinary. Nowadays, 200,000 plus is an easy target for modern unleaded piston engines and cars. No kidding. They're great. Fewer oil changes, all sorts of good stuff. Lead is problematic for piston engines. A lot of bad results from the use of lead. Lead also happens to be a poison to humans. That's another bad thing. Uh, the only big producer of lead right now that's being introduced into the atmosphere is aviation gasoline, okay? And I'll be the first to say that in reality it isn't much, but it's not killing our kids or anything, but frankly it would be a good thing to stop using it and polluting the air even a little bit, okay? It's problematic, so let's find an uh, alternative. But I can say that lead in, that, in an airplane engine is bad for operation and longevity. It results in dirty, nasty byproducts that shorten the life of our engines. And that is a proven fact, believe it or not. The result is that uh, we have a dilemma, okay? If we don't have the lead additive in our avgas, our engines would have to be operated at reduced power. Well, I think that's kind of dangerous on its face. So, you know, I mean, we, what do we do? Just park the airplane? Because you can't take off with half power or three quarter power. Uh, so what do we do? Well, that issue may already be decided. On 7 October 2022, that's just a few months ago as I, as I do this, the EPA announced a proposed determination that lead contributes to air pollution and is a hazard to public health. This is the endangerment finding we in general aviation has been afraid of, have been afraid of uh, for decades. This made the situation worse. It really, it did. With, the net, with that endangerment finding from the EPA, I would bet that we've got probably until the end of 2024 to find a replacement for 100 low lead avgas, or we're not flying these airplanes. There is good news, however, and it's a solution right on the horizon, okay? I've got in my hot little hands right here, STCs, there's two of them, one for the airframe, one for the engine, that say I can operate my airplane on G100 UL, okay, unleaded. That's unleaded fuel. It's from Gammy's, it's Gammy's version of unleaded fuel. There's a long and sordid story about the development of uh, this fuel. Governmental and industry intrigue to block Gammy's efforts for years and years. I'm not gonna get into it. If you really like to read more about it, Paul Bertarelli from AvWeb covered it way better than I can. So you should go read his article on it. For my part, I'm more interested in the technicalities of the fuel and the fact that I can continue to fly my airplanes. That's what I'm interested in is flying, is keeping to fly. George Brawley and Tim Royal uh, actually bet their company, General Aviation, uh, Jim Gammy, uh, on the development of this fuel. They started on the project over 12 years ago. And as memory serves, they had pretty much solved the chemical additive package by the end of 2012. That was 10 years ago. 
So it only, it only took 10 years, plus or minus a year or two, to get it certified, just in time. Uh, it was time pressure, and anyway. Uh, these days, folks tend to arm themselves with skepticism about any claim or development. I totally understand. I kind of have that approach, too. There are too many snake oil salesmen out there with all kinds of products that provide wondrous advantages. Just put this marvel stuff in your fuel or your oil and all your problems solved. The trouble is most of them don't actually test their product rigorously and, and the advertising doesn't equal the performance. Understand. But since GAMI announced the initial is issuance of the STC for the Cessna 172s at Oshkosh in 2021, I've heard lots of folks expressing these doubts about G100UL. I'll wait and see. Uh, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna buy into this thing. You know, it sounds like hokum to me. Okay, I understand their positions. Science has become politicized in way too many areas, and that has led to a, a general mistrust of, well, science, you know. And advertising is one thing, and people say all kinds of stuff. That's not necessarily true. I'm not gonna get into the politics of that. Uh, to me, in many ways, politics has corrupted science and journalism. So be careful about what and who you believe. I dig it. I try myself to take that a aspect of it, but I believe in facts. There seemed to be a belief that determinism is dead and truth is situational. I totally disagree with that. Enough of the philosophy. I don't want to get into that. I first met George and Tim uh, back in the mid-90s when they were embroiled in the Lena Peak controversies. They were... That's when they started, they came out in 96, I think it was, with GAM ejectors, which is speak directly to being able to do Lena Peak. The facts made sense to me, and now I'll hazard a guess that Lena Peak is a widespread, is in widespread use across the entire general aviation world. George is an engineer at heart, and data is everything. What they did with the success of the GAM ejectors is to build a state-of-the-art engine test stand, okay, where you can really get data with sensors for anything they could think of, and whatever something new happened, they come up with a new sensor. They began working on an electronic ignition system that worked using pressure sensors inside each cylinder, it was actually in the spark plug, and then adjusting the spark timing between events, or be for the next event, if you will. And uh, we're talking small fractions of a second, 2,700 RPM or whatever, 3,000, you know, at all, it's crazy. All, it's all based on data collected from real world, in real world engines run on their one-of-a-kind uh, state-of-the-art test stand. Nobody else has one of them. Nobody would invest in it. They're, they were ideally suited to figure out this problem of chemi a chemical package that su could supplant lead for high-octane ratings. And they did just that 10 years ago. Fast forward to now, and these STCs are available for all piston engine airplanes from a J3 or lower and, uh, up to the Merlins and the great big Warbird radials that they have in the Warbird world. In my opinion, my opinion, they saved GA. And I think they should be congratulated. I know their stuff works. I've seen the data, I've seen the test stand. This stuff is real. Their stuff is based on data, based on fact. The last and final big test was run on 20 December 2020 with the FA in attendance and they, they compared uh, 100 low lead with G100 UL and the test led directly to the approval and issuance of these STCs. If you ask me, I'm sure they'll, I'm sure they'll give you a copy, if you ask them, up of that, those test results. Not me, I've got one copy, you can ask them for one. Essentially, the G100 low-lead, unleaded fuel showed improved detonation performance compared to the current 100 low-lead spec fuel. Under pressures and temperatures greater than that achieved by any engine operating in the GA fleet at the present time. It's a drop-in replacement. I don't, I don't think a 4360. I don't know, maybe a 4360. <clears throat> Radio, 5,000 horsepower. In fact, you can mix it with 100 low lead at any quantity and detonation margins will not be adversely affected. Bottom line, G100 UL fuel is missable with 100 low lead. Fancy word, look it up, missable. It's not widely available right now, unfortunately. Distribution network takes time to uh, build up, and to some degree, it increased availability will depend on demand. Chicken and the egg sort of thing. The first folks to get this fuel have been in, the, in those in California 
directly affected by the cities that uh, did a local finding themselves and prohibited, prohibited the use of leaded fuel. I know some of you are asking about costs. Will it be more? Well, probably. Ultimately, costs will be determined by demand. One thing to consider is that the FAA has no other option in the works. Frankly, Swift Fuel will not be a player for the majority of general aviation piston fleet for lots of reasons. I mean, good on them, but no. So what are you going to do? Well, I suggest that you want to, if you want to keep flying, that you go to the GAMI website and buy an STC for your airplane and your engine. Thank the FAA for the need to have two STCs. GAMI's priced it by horsepower using the same models that uh, other folks did uh, with other unleaded fuel STC vendors. This is the website right here. I'll put it right here. And I'll also, also leave a link in the description below. I don't get anything from the, uh, these sales, so I'm, they're not sponsoring me. GAMI is licensing the production of the fuel and they will not make it themselves. They will monitor it to make sure that uh, everything's made up to spec. You can hedge your bets and go with auto gas, okay? Uh, don't forget, you gotta stay away from ethanol. That's not a good thing to mix with uh, airplanes. Sometimes, real soon, sometime real soon now, buying 100 low lead avgas at airports is gonna be an issue, it won't be available. So what are you gonna do? Well, you can make the choice then if you wanna sit on your hands. For me, I bought G100 UL STCs for all three of my airplanes and I'm betting uh, on a rapid expansion of G100 UL availability and because I really look forward to the clean burning aspect of it, uh, incredibly. And in the meantime, I'll use 100 low lead. Remember, it's missable with G100 UL. And oh, by the way, you can still fly Lena Peak with it too. So I hope you liked the video. And if you did, hit like and subscribe. It looks a bit like this here. And I'd like to thank my Patreon folks here as well. Appreciate y'all's support. Uh, and if you want to support the channel on Patreon, I'll leave a link below. Oh, by the way, my store is below too, if you like that. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Flywire.